Coming back out of closed session, there you go. Um, reporting out of closed session, uh, information was received and direction was given. Um, and on to the Pledge of Allegiance, I will ask Ms. Katie Niemer to direct us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, we'll move on to communications and celebrations, and I will turn that over to Superintendent Gillen. Thank you, President Menke. We have one celebration this evening. We want to recognize and thank the women of the Moose for their $200 donation to Southport School. Um, this contribution will assist in the Sly Park field trip this year. Thank you very much, women of the Moose. Okay. Student board member report, and I do not see a student board member. I'm guessing it's the holidays. We'll chalk it up to that. Um, California School uh, Employees Association, CSEA report. Miss Deborah Hearn, welcome, and I wish you a Merry Christmas, too. I, oh, I don't see you. I wish all of you guys Merry Christmas, too, and Happy Holidays. I hope you had a, a good Thanksgiving, and um, this is really the best time of the year. I just love this time of the year. Um, the only uh, thing I would like to be able to ask of the board members, please, we have our annual catered Christmas party that's coming up next week, and I have invitations here for you guys. I would really like to see uh, each and every one of you there. Uh, if you, uh, it starts around 6 o'clock, so if I can just hand you your invitations. So I would love to see each and every one of you guys. So I hope you guys are able to make it. Um, and once again, happy holidays to, to you. Thank you. And WTA report, Mr. Don Stoffer. And a Merry Christmas and happy holidays yeah. to you. Yes, and uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. Happy holidays. Hope you have a safe holiday this year. Um, I'm sorry I have to report the uh, passing of two former WTA members. Uh, Ed Lloyd, uh, who retired a number of years ago, but taught for a long time at Gold, Golden State Middle School. And also Kathy Costanza, who uh, worked up until last year in this district, and she was tragically killed last month. Um, so anyway, uh, our thoughts are with their families. Negotiations. Um, I, I'm happy to report that we had a very productive negotiation session on Monday. And we are meeting again on the 16th, next Monday. Um, we've moved forward on a number of, uh, of the remaining issues. And uh, we've reached tentative agreements on, on three of our open articles. So we're, we're feeling pretty good about things. So I'm hoping we can uh, reach consensus on most of our remaining items next week. It would be a nice Christmas present for everybody, I believe. So um, I want to be optimistic. I don't want to be too crazy, but it'd be nice if we if we can get things uh, wrapped up as much as possible next week. And I'm if it it uh, is next Monday is like this Monday was. I think we'll we'll get there. Um, and again, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, safe travels, and uh, hopefully I'll see you out there in the world somewhere. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Mr. Don Stoffer. Uh, moving on to public comments, and I see none at this time. Um, board and superintendent comments and committee updates. Uh, anyone would like to start off? Ms. Villegas? This feels so awkward over here. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to remind folks that the Yellow County Children's Alliance and the West Sacramento Family Resource Center is having an open house tomorrow. Everyone's invited to stop by if you can between 1130 and 1. Um, our um, Families are making uh, pozole, and it's all homemade food, and we'd love to have you. So if anybody, 1130 to 1 at the old Bright Campus, room 22. And happy holidays to everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Ms. Leland. Uh, yes, I just want to thank the district for sending um, 
me to the California School Board Association meeting. It was um, a really great meeting, and I know Sarah probably will report out some of the sessions that she went to, too, but it's like uh, every year is something new, and uh, one thing that kind of caught my attention was one of the, the sessions that we had um, on a book called Reality is Broken. And this book is about why games make us better and can change the wor world. And what they're talking about is video games. And we thought this woman was absolutely out of her mind. She was talking about, you know, our, our kids and, and the, the teenagers and even younger kids that we see, you know, spending hours and hours, uh, a billion of them, there's a billion gamers out there, uh, playing these video games and that there's some real worth in that, and there's uh, many positive things that come out of, of gaming. And so this book, Reality is Broken, by Jane um, McGonigal, is fascinating on how they took some of the principles from gaming and the way these video games are designed and applied them to uh, some incredible uh, research uh, both in biomedicine, they did some things with, I, I believe it was the New York Library or Boston Public Library. And so um, I thought that was particularly just so insightful. And um, I am already bought some copies of that book and, and some extra copies that I'm giving uh, to some teachers that I know in my family. But beyond the, uh, the, the session, the, the general session, where all 4,500 of us are together, and we see great talent from around the state. They bring in student groups that perform for us. Uh, I really had a chance this year to kind of focus on some of the sessions and, and also download some materials and pick up materials that I thought some of the other board members uh, would enjoy since uh, they weren't there. So if you're OK with it, um, Mr. President, I would like to just hand out my little personal packets from CSBA. And uh, I brought Alicia Cruz. I brought you some really nice material on uh, child nutrition. Uh, there's also um, uh, some great material on parent engagement. Uh, certainly, Katie, I think you'll enjoy some of the community partnership information that we have. Um, Adam, I brought you the right material. I sat in on a bond workshop on uh, financing um, another workshop called Do You Speak Budget? You would have. You would have been so happy I attended that, Scott. <laughs> Scott's speak, not allowed. <laughs> budget. And uh, so I brought some of those uh, poignant and some technology uh, things for you. And then Sarah, I know, had her own uh, packet that she brought back with her and, and enjoyed. So I'll let her talk about it. So let me just um, hand the packets out real quick. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Trinkets, you know, we get trinkets. Ooh, an apple cutter. You got a banana, a stress and you got a really cute food bag. Adam, I hope you enjoy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I make one more comment? I forgot sure. to add one thing. Nope, I just, you lost your time. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, I just wanted to bring up one thing that I mentioned to, to Bill Spaulding. I met a woman that's in charge of, uh, or actually works with Junior Achievement. And I don't know if we have Junior Achievement here in Washington Unified, but I don't think we do at the high school in junior year. It was an awesome program that I actually participated when I was in a uh, junior in high school, and I got a lot out of it and still um, just a f fabulous experience for me, and I'd love to find a way to bring that here to the district because I think it's an awesome way to show kids and introduce kids to business. And I learned a lot from that one experience that I had. So <coughs> more to come on that. I'll keep Bill posted. Thank you. Ms. Kirby Gonzalez. Um, you make me laugh, um, Board Member Vegas, because I just brought a junior achievement packet. <laughs> <laughs> and I also talked to somebody at junior <laughs> achievement to come here. Um, one of the speakers that we listened to talked a lot about entrepreneurship. Yeah. And uh, junior achievement really does that. So um, that was perfect. Couldn't perfect. have had it better. Um, 
And also, I really appreciated getting to go down to CSBA. Um, thank you to the district and the taxpayers for funding that trip because it was uh, very uh, meaningful. And got to see lots of great workshops, one on civic learning uh, that was wonderful. And I, I thought of you a lot because we talked about bringing kids into the court systems and doing some really great things. Um, they do have an award, too, um, for civic learning that we could look at down the road, maybe. I know we have a lot going on this year with our strategic <coughs> priorities. We're missing the deadline, but for next year, it's a possibility. They have um, 20 award winners around the state, and it would be a great thing to bring some awareness uh, to our district. So I'm keeping all that. Unlike um, board member Leland, mine is all still in <laughs> one big packet. I haven't organized it all yet. Uh, also, I would say the highlight was... For me, listening to Linda Darling Hammond speak as well, she has a great book out right now on getting teacher evaluation right. And as we talk about our um, strategic priorities, one of them being high expectations, um, absolutely high expectations and, and good stuff in terms of evaluation. And one that came up a lot in there was national board certification. And I think it would be great if there was a way that the district and board could support teachers if they wanted to. It's an optional process um, in that down the road. Um, and I think that's the most of that. I'm still digesting. I'm holding on to all of it. There's a lot of good stuff. And um, I'll bring it back in pieces and, and touch base with some of you. But junior achievement definitely struck out. And I'm looking forward to junior achievement because I have a junior in high school. So maybe <laughs> hope we can do this quickly. Um, <laughs> uh, Ms. Vice President Cruz. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate the 2013 graduating class of PK this year. There was 33 graduates, and when I first went to PK, um, my husband and I, he was actually the only male that took the class. So out of the 33 graduates, half of them were men. So I was glad to see that, and um, wonderful program, and I hope we can definitely continue it. Um, also, I'd like to congratulate my fellow board members, Katie and Sarah, for making it through our first year. <laughs> and I do want to thank Mary and Adam for the patience and guidance through the years to help us uh, get, get here. And I'm looking forward to um, another successful school year. And I do hope everybody has a safe and um, great holiday. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. I also want to uh, give my warm wishes for the holidays and uh, hopefully every stays safe. Uh, and then we can embark on the second half of our uh, school year uh, for a lot of great things and then in, in that with a great graduation of a lot of uh, seniors in our school district. Um, from there, we want to move on to our board governance discussion. Is there anybody wants to discuss anything for board governance? Nothing tonight? Yes, I'd, li oh, I'd, I'd like Cruz. one thing that maybe we can have on our future agenda. And I've been reading a lot and seeing a lot about um, board evaluations. And so I know we talked a little bit, you and I. Mm -hmm. And so I hope down the line that's something we can look at as a board is to evaluate ourselves on maybe what we've accomplished on our goals or anything. That'd be, that'd be great. And we, we have talked about that. And it was maybe something we can discuss more in um, our session uh, in January, uh, board governance team session uh, for our goals and what we want to do with that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, anybody else for board governance? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, on to information discussion items. Uh, number one, school uh, innovations and achievement, SINA -S initiatives. Mr. Gilland. Yes, thank you very much. Last time we met in, in November, we had Cara de Blasio here from School Innovations and Achievement. I wanted to make sure I got that right this evening. I blundered on that last time. Um, Kara was here and talked a little bit about our success with attendance initiatives and um, the benefits we've seen from those efforts and our partnership with SNI, SNA. And um, we kind of gave a precursor to a couple of initiatives that are on the agenda this evening for consent. Um, one is the K-3 initiative that really focuses specific attention to um, kindergarten through third grade students because we see a very high um, preponderance of absenteeism at that particular point. And obviously, parents are making those decisions for the kids at that time. So we really want to um, reach out to that parent group. And I think what's compelling with that work is that you really reach out to all K-3 parents. So the communication is really 
across the board, and it's a very positive message. I think that speaks to strategic priorities when we talk about high achievement and expectations um, therein. The second initiative is a leadership initiative, and this is, um, this is where we heard about showing up. The importance of being here, is, uh, you know, simply being in, in your seat is not necessarily enough, but showing up, again, linking to a strategic priority of high achievement and high expectations. You know, there's also a, a key element in our common core, we'll hear a little bit more from Mr. Spaulding about the Common Core and the local control funding formula and the LCAP that talk about enhancing our parent involvement. So these are communication mechanisms that could enhance us with that. So I'm going to invite Kara to come up and talk a little bit, but I wanted to just kind of give a precursor to how I see this fitting with our, our overarching goals. So Kara, thank you again for being here. Hello. Thank you for having us here again. Welcome. Okay, so as we saw last time, this is just a quick um, overview of the highlights from last year. Our, our, um, in only six months of partnering together, uh, you were able to implement that consistent district-wide process for notification of absences to parents. We had a 343% increase in parent communication, and again, that's in just six months of partnering together. Uh, nearly 6,000 communication pieces and intervention touch points, and one of the the most important things about our partnership is the ability for us to work together and provide that, that comparative, actionable data that's going to help us decide what next steps in our partnership are, what's going on within the district, looking at percentages, what, what stories uh, is the data telling, and how we can use that, again, to inform our next steps of working together. Um, again, this is just a really quick p picture of the truant excused absences and chronic absences by grade from last year, 2012-13. Um, and as uh, Dr. Gilliland mentioned, we're going to be focusing quite a bit um, through the rest of this year going forward on your kindergarten through third grade students. Obviously, you can see that 8% of kindergartners are chronically absent, which means 8% of kindergartners have missed 10% of the school year last year or more, and that's excused, unexcused, um, and particularly with kindergartners, there's a chance they may not have received any type of notification, particularly if they are under the age of six. This is also your total absence summary. And as Dr. Gilliland mentioned, going forward with some of the initiatives today, we're really going to be focusing on what we call the students that are on the tipping point. And those students are these in the manageable group. Um, this is your total absence summary from last year. So that number of students, which is we ended the year at just above 1,500, could be a little different when we pull those mid-year numbers for the 13-14 year. But the, that's the group we're going to be focusing on with the leadership initiative. And again, these were the key indicators for moving forward and in our discussions uh, with your superintendent, with Mr. Spaulding, about how we can work more to communicate more in a positive manner with your students and with your parents. So for the students in the manageable group, that's part of the leadership initiative and the tipping point. Those 1,500 students, 1,500 plus students, your manageable students are easily influenced. Those are the students where we can change negative absence behaviors more quickly. These students are not chronically absent, but yet they don't have the positive attendance behaviors of your satisfactory and your excellent students. So we're going to be working um, with those once we pull the analysis again for the midpoint in the 13-14 year. We're also looking at your kindergarten and here obviously PK PK through third grade, we'll be working with those students. And you know, we know in all of the studies that we've read, and you all have read them, we're all kind of blue in the face from reading about them. Uh, if students are not proficient by the time they're in third grade, there's a 30% chance that they will drop out of high school, drop out of school, really. And we want to start to positively message to the parents in kindergarten, pre-K, through third grade about the importance of showing up, of being here every day. And as you all have discussed, you know, with Common Core rollout, it's, it's more important than ever 
that our students show up. So we're gonna be focusing on K3 as well. And again, we're talking about continuing to cultivate and create that culture of achievement here at Washington Unified. And you've really started to do that by enlisting the organization, getting the process set with the base, which is attention to attendance. You have the notification to parents of absences going. What we wanna do is increase the communication in a positive way that has nothing necessarily to do with absences. That's really our, our K3 and our leadership. Um, and then the tipping point is in addition to that. We want to do all of these things. We want to continue to communicate with you, communicate with your community, support the efforts, support the efforts of your strategic plan, um, what you have all laid out for the rest of the school year and also next year. We want to measure the right things. We want to show you the data. We want to, again, talk about what stories the data is telling. Provide that oversight to you, which again leads to that culture of achievement and increases parent and student engagement as well as employee commitment. Again, enlisting, uh, enlisting the organization, we have this going. The process is set with A2A. And again, through leadership, through the vision that you all are setting, that Dr. Gilliland is setting, this is important to you. This is important to the community. We're clarifying the mission, which again for us is going to be this concept of showing up. How can we continue to create this culture of achievement here to continue building on what we've already started together to, um, to have this be you know, a culture of achievement here at the district. Showing up again is an attitude. It's not as, as the superintendent, mess or superintendent mentioned, it's not just am I here, did I get checked off in the roll book? It's am I engaged, am I ready, am I here, am I you know, showing up for school, it's an attitude, you don't have to show up and work, we all had, have to show up here tonight, everyone has to show up and you've gotta do your part and that's what this is about, is messaging to showing up. And again, we know for those early grade students, it's, it's a, decision, a decision made by the parents at that level. And we want those students to have the idea of showing up ingrained in them at these early grades so that when they move on to secondary, it's already instilled in them when they're making the decision themselves. So this is how we're gonna start moving forward with this, and this is part of the leadership campaign. These are the deliverables. This is what we'll be working on for the rest of the year. We'll be working on the communication pieces out to the community through press releases, interviews with the superintendent. We'll be pulling those uh, mid-year report reviews for you, coming back, presenting the results, taking the positives out of those results, doing more press releases. Again, how can we positively message to the community about what's going on here in the district? We'll also be doing that mid-year chronic absenteeism report, so you'll get to see that pie chart as to how the, student, um, how the students are coming out as far as absences. And then we'll come back at the end of the year and do an end of year report. And one of the most important pieces of this will be the recognition program that's going to happen. And we'll decide what is the criteria for recognizing these sites, principals, uh, attendance clerks, and we'll bring them here and we'll do a meeting together, a ceremony together, where you all will, will help us present these awards to these um, specific site staff. It's really exciting and again another positive piece that we can um, highlight to the community. The most important part I, I feel about the leadership um, initiative is this idea of the tipping point. So these are those manageable students, your students who have missed between five to 9.99% of the school year. So what we're gonna be doing is, so that those results that we saw before, the 1,500 plus students, that was your 13, four, or excuse me, 12-13 uh, results. What we're going to be doing is doing an analysis here in about a month or so with where are the students at this point in the 13-14 year, the midpoint this year. We'll identify those manageable students who have missed between five and 9.99% of the school year so far, and we'll be sending a positive message to those students and their parents from the superintendent. It will be a letter that goes home, and it'll be a positive uh, notification of how much school, how much of the school year has been missed, how many days, goals for the rest of the year. We'll pull the same type of information at the end of the year for those students that are still considered to be on the tipping point. So those students that didn't quite make it back into satisfactory, we'll message to them again with positive goal-oriented messages about what we can do for the 14-15 year. 
And then at the beginning of next fall, the 14, 15 year, those students will once again receive a positive, encouraging notification from the superintendent. So we can try and make sure that those students are in the satisfactory group next year. And with the K-3 initiative, again, we'll be working together to create those pieces that are gonna go out to all parents with students third grade and under. We'll be sending colorful, again, positive notification to those parents talking about this idea of showing up, how it's so important for our students, particularly in the early grades. And as soon as, um, as soon as we're done here tonight and, and, and this gets approved, we'll be sending something out right before the holidays on the launch of showing up to these parents so we can start getting the idea and the message of showing up out to the families right now. So as far as our next steps, again, we're gonna be doing some interviews to get some messaging and communication style together. We'll be um, working with your sites on the enhancement of our partnership to talk about the showing up aspect of all of this. And really, as far as leadership goes, the most important thing is that tipping point analysis. What students have missed, how many students have missed between five and 9.99% of the school year so far? How can we message to them? What are we gonna be uh, sending to them? And as far as the K-3 initiative, again, we'll be sending out a notification to all parents. It's, it's, a, it's a positive, um, again, colorful notification that showing up is now important to the district and how can we make that more important um, to, you know, to those families. And then we'll be sending out additional communication pieces throughout the remainder of the year. And all of these additional pieces we'll be able to report to you on about how many, the number, and that will in turn, of course, um, affect your, your LCFF and LCAP um, reporting capabilities. And that is all I have. If anyone has any questions for me. Well, thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. And for showing up and presenting for hey. us tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I will open it up for any comments or questions from the board. I just think it's a very um, comprehensive program. It's uh, data driven. I think it's important that we uh, you know, address this early, and so I like that emphasis on kindergarten and setting that parent culture, and mm -hmm. I, I just think it's great that we're doing this. It's not just about the loss of AD, ADA, it's about, you know, kids can't learn if they're not in school. Exactly. And, uh, so I, I think it's a great program. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Kirby's else. Thank you. Yes, we, um, one of the things, too, that Linda Darlingham and who I mentioned earlier talked about was um, that college and career ready, so many things aren't on a test, and one is showing up, and one is being there, and it's important for our kids. So I have two questions yes. quickly. One would be, um, I know that since we've implemented the district attendance initiatives three years ago, um, that we've seen an increase in about $518,000, I think, $100,000. And so I wonder if you think that there will continue to be an increase since this has happened for three years already. If um, how, how big of a gap do you think that there is still to fill? You know, that I can't necessarily comment on. What I can comment on is we know in all of the work that we do, we work with um, over 85 school districts. We have over a million students that are on attention to attendance. And in all of the, um, the work that we've done with districts, we know that when you increase parent communication and parent involvement, and when you talk about showing up and continue to get the message across in you know, letters that go home, in pieces in the media, in news stories. So when we're seeing things in many different, in many different facets, the message gets across, and when the message gets across, the parents ensure that their students come to school. If they're notified of an unexcused absence, they turn around and make sure that that doesn't happen again. And when that happens, attendance does increase. So I can't necessarily guarantee how much as far as what a percentage increase would be or what kind of you know, monetary value that would have, but I can guarantee that when we're messaging to these families, there, your, more kids are going to show up. It's it's definitely going to happen. And when we when we looked at um, the data the last time, and what we'll continue to be able to um, report on as far as your attendance notifications is when those notifications do go out, what we call the save rate. The students who don't qualify for the next type of letter is 
is large. It's large. It's 54% um, average across all of our clients. So that's 54% of students who receive one notification that after that one, they immediately change the behavior. So we see it as still being self-funded, I guess, would it be my main question, is that we still see this program as being self-funded in itself? If, if the program generates uh, an increase in ADA, yes, it would self-fund itself. Thank you. And then my only other question is, um, has there ever been, or have you with other districts or maybe here looked into students who are late and ever addressing them? I know that they might not be an increase in terms of ADA, but just when we look at showing up, um, in terms of being on time, is that any component to it? We actually do have a component where, uh, and this would be something we could talk about, we do have tardy notifications. Um, obviously, if it's 30, 30 minutes plus tardy, then that's considered truant um, or, you know, excused or unexcused, regardless of if it's, you know, an excused tardy or an unexcused tardy. Um, we do have the capacity to, um, to talk about adding tardy notifications, but that would be something we would talk about probably at your end of year, and we can look at you know, how many, um, a frequency of a code, of an attendance code or a tardy code, and we could do it that way, yeah. The idea with these notifications is to get to the students and the parents before an absence or a tardy would even um, take place. That's the, that's the goal, but yeah, yeah. Ms. Cruz? Thank you for the presentation. And and uh, I look forward to this program. And the one thing that I do notice is uh, the consistency in the language, because mm -hmm. I think that's really important um, to be repetitive. And I'm looking, you know, creating a culture of success. If we're trying to create a, uh, we have a culture of high expectations is one of our goals. So mm -hmm. hearing that um, really, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, helps I wrote um, that parents. down, by the way, <laughs> high expectations. And um, I do look forward in uh, being part of the recognition at the end of the year. So Great. thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I think this is largely important. I think it's a, a great thing. And I know we do some things in our district already. Um, before becoming a parent, I always said, there's no way I'm not going to know when my kids aren't at school. But you get lost in work and life and things. And But uh, the high school does have a robocall and, and notifies us. And this mm -hmm. is the first question we go down. Um, for us, it's luckily it's just uh, being late to class because they like to talk too much in passing. Um, but, it, but it notifies us. It makes us aware. Um, and I think when parents are aware, they're more apt at doing something as opposed to they get busy in their lives like we all do and you just kind of gloss over it. You're like, I'll, I'll, I'll check into that. And so it, 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 it opens them up to understanding what's going on with their child and, and it does. It promotes them or provokes them to then go have that discussion of well, what will happen there? Why weren't you there? Or right. why were you late? Um, so, and, and Ms. Leland is, is definitely correct that they cannot learn if they're not in the chair. Right. Um, so I think that's a, a good thing that we don't only just look at the high school and, and find ways of keeping those kids behind mm -hmm. bars at times um, with high school. It's more about promoting that school is the thing you need to be, you need to be present, you need to show up, and you need to be productive. Uh, so when there, it's, it's almost like a, um, it, it's a culture. And when you get Absolutely. to high school, it's a culture mm -hmm. uh, in which we will have in this district. So, uh, and as far as the funding, I do agree with when you increase ADA, it pretty much, it pays for itself almost. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've talked about that in length. And I know in the past when ADA first came around, when, you know, uh, No Child Left Behind was, you know, paying for ADA, and we're not going to pay for the kids that aren't even in school, um, then there was a big push for ADA. Uh, and I think this is a different type of thing. This isn't push to get kids right. here because we need to get paid. It's more of a culture of you, you can't learn if you're not here. Exactly. And that's important in life uh, and for longevity. So, uh, again, I... I Thank you so much for showing up and oh, coming here you. and presenting to us. It's very enlightening and, and uh, enthusiastic because it's it's something positive for our district and our children. So right. thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Uh, on to number two, uh, information discussion items, 2012-2013. Uh, I never say this right, so I say Casey or Cashy. However you say it, potato, potato, results. So, Mr. Gilliand. Point of clarification, down south it is Casey. I find in West Sacramento it's Cassie. <laughs> so the jury's still out. It is truly a potato, <laughs> potato. Um, Mr. Spalding does have a presentation. This is a, one of the student performance indicators on the calendar, and probably something we'll move to earlier in the year when we're talking about 
assessment data from the previous year, but that, I think that's probably going to be part of our discussion, too. We want to talk about calendars when we have our January um, work session, so that's probably a, an item for further discussion. But Mr. Spalding is ready now. Good evening, President Menke, members of the board, Dr. Gilliland. And I remember when, <clears throat> when Casey first came out and when we had this conversation, whether it was Casey or Cassie, and the kids would say, let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> so anyways, um, now I know who knows that song. Um, anyways, um, I just want to go through some of these as basic facts, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to, to go through all these items, but I think we all know what Casey is. We've been at this for about 10 or 12 years. Um, it's first taken in the 10th grade by students, and uh, it's really the 10th grade results that are, that are reported and tracked by the state. And uh, so I, what I want to do is bring you some additional information. There's some that's in your packet that really talks about what this last administration uh, of 12-13 had for us last year. And I think you saw those numbers. Um, probably the, the most um, telling thing is that there's some concerns there with our special education numbers. Those were, were off. But for the most part, numbers that were, were fairly similar to what we saw statewide. Um, but I wanted to get into some comparisons and some things I could show you over time and I thought might be useful and, and informative. Um, we have a, a couple of different slides here from River City High School. This is the English language arts slide. And it shows really the, the KC passage performance, again, 10th grade, first swipe at the test over time. And I think what you'll see, um, you see the blue represents the school. That, that it's a pretty tight pattern there, you see, uh, with, the, with the graph. But the blue represents the school. Uh, orange represents the district, of course, with, with River City being most of who takes it in the district. And, and then the state result numbers. And the, the couple of things that really, I think, stand out there is that uh, we're fairly close to the state. We're seeing growth in, in passage rates over time, and that's always a positive thing. And ours are pretty close to what we see in the state. It pretty much mirrors what's happening in the state as far as that goes. Um, and, it's, and it's an ever-growing uh, number. We also know that students have multiple opportunities to pass the KC after the 10th grade. So, you know, even when you're looking at an 84% passage rate, you know that the remainder, uh, the remaining 16% have multiple opportunities, uh, and, and most do, um, before, before graduation. Uh, similarly, for the math, uh, for the math KC, we see um, very similar kind of growth along the lines of what we're seeing in the state. Um, in some places where we're actually exceeding the state. I know there's a little bit of disparity sometimes between what we've seen on CSTs and what we're seeing with Casey. Um, just a reminder that the Casey math is really based more on kind of uh, algebra and pre-algebra and some of the algebraic uh, pieces, not really much past algebra. Um, and I would expect to see with, with Common Core that we see some uh, changes in Casey over time. None plan right this, right this minute, but I know that they're looking at that. I do want to uh, kind of call out a caveat as we go to Yolo High School because we have kind of the same uh, dynamic that a lot of times we've seen with our API and with our CST scores, um, and that is that we have a very small sample size. And in this case, with our students who are taking um, Casey, it would be 10th graders who are enrolled at Yolo High School. And for a lot of these years, when you see kind of these off numbers, 8%, 16%, Sixteen percent. We're talking about twenty-two or twenty-three kids. So you'll see those kind of fluctuations. You know, a lot of times in those numbers. I think the other thing to point out for Yolo is that um, mostly it's juniors and seniors who are coming to Yolo who are credit deficient. So the students who are coming as sophomores tend to be, you know, pretty pretty strongly credit deficient. So so always, you know, kind of walking in the door with with. Uh, with some real struggles in school. So I, I want to just kind of be careful about those numbers because I know that um, they're not going to be as representative. It's going to be a, a, a group of students who um, are having some difficulty if they're taking the 10th grade KC at YOLO and they're already at YOLO because of credit deficiency. Um, we do see a trend upwards and uh, we monitor that and we're, we're happy to see that trend upwards and we continue to, to watch that. That's English language arts. Um, similarly, in, in mathematics, although not quite as dramatic as what we saw in English language arts, but again, um, wanting to be to caution the board as it looks at these numbers that we are really talking about small sample sizes when we look at this. Finally, I wanted to bring you some information, and I'm not going to go through each of these, but I think it does, um, it, it is valuable information. It's disaggregated, and I would leave this with you to kind of peruse at your, your leisure. Um, we're using, you're going to see some new nomenclature now. When you see LI, you're probably wondering, what is LI? Um, for years, we've been talking about students who are living in poverty, students who qualify for free and reduced lunch programs. 
as SED, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, with the with the advent of the um, LCFF program, I'm starting to see it referenced to, as LI or low income. We're talking really about the same set of students, but they're changing. It looks like they're changing the acronym for that. But what I offer here is some uh, real interesting information that's broken down by our subgroups. And this is important because we'll be talking about LCFF in a few minutes. And we have... Um, you know, we have some, well, we've always had responsibilities for our subgroups, and we've always been working towards closing the achievement gap. But the LCFF process really accentuates that and, and really has you planning and calling out your subgroups and, and talking about what you're going to do to meet state priorities. So we, we have this these numbers broken out. And I think you can see even within certain subgroups and certain communities of students, there is a, a difference in performance based on whether those students live in, in poverty or not. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons that, in fact, probably the major reason that the LCFF is, is really heavily based on, um, on, on trying to anticipate for poverty. Um, but the other thing I think you'll see as you go through uh, for both ELA and mathematics is we've seen some pretty strong percentage changes among these groups. And we've seen some real growth in performance going, this one goes back further, uh, goes back to 2004. So in a, you know, in a nine year period, we've seen some, some pretty dramatic gains in uh, KC passage rates or CASI passage rates. And then turning to, to math, very similarly, um, again, we see the, the dynamic of, of uh, poverty in student performance, um, but we also see that overall we're seeing some real growth with, with our, our subgroups. And that is what I had. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, I'll open up to the board discussion or questions. Ruby Gonzalez. Thank you for this. Um, I'm wondering why we're um, only seeing 10th grade, because are there also, that would be my question. Um, those are those are the numbers that are reported by the state and that are tracked by the state. We're doing some internal work to, to better track um, our students in our system, uh, in our software system. Um, I was able to, to gain some information from the high school just to kind of track what is this meant for, for students who are uh, in graduating. And over the last few years, um, we've seen that on the average we have uh, about four students per the last couple of years whose, uh, whose Casey scores is what kept them from graduation. So it's something we remain concerned about. We have programs at the school to, to I don't want to say remediate, but to try to intervene. Um, so a lot of work is done that way, but, but we do see some of that, and we do want to, we're, we want to be very thoughtful and, and very um, deliberate about how we support those students. Thank you. I have a quick question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, what are the on the <coughs> on your last two charts? What are the the asterisks? In oh, I'm sorry, I missed that completely. Asterisks are where there was no reportable information, so that the students were not um, in in that particular year. Uh, there weren't students from that group, or were not reportable. Reportable meaning they didn't take the that test. That they weren't. Or? They were. They they hadn't taken the test, or there weren't students from that group who had who had test results. And how was the um, the LI, the low income, calculated? Is it just from the free reduced lunches? Correct, or? correct. The state takes that the the state takes that information and gives it back to us based on that. So they do all the tracking. This is one of the things that the CalPads has really helped us do to really track our student demographics. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to point out before you get going on that one is. Um, is I, I really encouraged by Yolo County or Yolo County Yolo High School, um, the positive changes that have happened there mm -hmm. that we've seen some of their scores, uh, and I think it reflects here in their in their Casey, uh, Cassie, thing. Um, it's 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 encouraging. I like that, and I hope to see. I hope I would like to think that that is based on the positive culture there that Mr. Morisich has created, and that we'll see continued growth there in that market for uh, for Casey scores. So. Mr. Gillian. Thank you. I just wanted to back up real quickly to Mrs. Crew's question regarding the asterisks. And my understanding, if you could just explain a little bit about the significant number that really would constitute that subgroup for reportable data, Mr. Spalding. Yeah, I think I think there has to be a uh, um, I think there has to be a threshold number, and I want to say it's fifteen percent. But I, I could get back to you with okay. what that ex actual number well, that's, is. That's what it. determines it. it. Doesn't necessarily indicate that we do not have students in that group that are important to us. It's Correct. just a matter of how the state reports that data. That's Correct. I'm sorry I misspoke that, but I can bring back those details. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and on to number three, developer fee accounting uh, for fiscal 2012-2013. <coughs> Mr. Gillen or Scott Lansberger. Uh, what you have in front of you for uh, this report, this is just an annual report that you get every year. Uh, it's a legal requirement that we tell you what uh, happened in the developer fee fund as far as the beginning fund balance, fees that came in, interest that was earned, expenditures and where those expenditures went. Uh, there's no action that has to be taken uh, with this report. This is just an information item for the board. I'll ask if there's any questions or comments from the board. Seeing none, we'll move on to number four, information discussion items, LCFF slash LCAP information update. Mr. Gillen. Thank you again. This, I believe, is Mr. Spalding's local control funding formula presentation, also addressing the local control <coughs> accountability plan. Um, Scott may be chiming in because this has um, dramatic overlap in terms of program and finance, so there's implications for all of us. Julie Hoskins is here because she's really our overseer of what was categorical funding and now will be instrumental in, in the management of, of work involving our special groups that are identified. Bill. Thank you. Good evening, President Menke, members of the board, Dr. Gilliland. Uh, we want to bring you back some information um, and, and some updates on local control funding formula. Um, I think that the board has been, um, has been exposed to this through the year, particularly through the budgeting development process, but it has, as Dr. Gilliland said, some pretty major implications for, for how we do everything. Um, I would say that on July 1st, 2013, um, everything changed for us in terms of the fiscal uh, accountability or the, the, the accountability in the fiscal model and uh, we're working in a completely different world we have a system that we've been working with for probably close to 40 years that has been completely upended and changed so we want to talk a little bit about what that means and then there's some activities and things that we're gonna be involved with in pretty intensively over the next few weeks next few months in getting ready to uh, deliver our first LCFF budget and our first LCAP for 14 15 you know, essentially, and, and I think everyone knows this, but just to kind of to kind of review, um, really the idea behind LCFF is that we'd have more money for high need students. That there's a way of accounting, and we talked a little bit in that Casey um, presentation about the impact of poverty on students who, and and other issues uh, for English learners, for example, learning a new language as you're trying to learn the content. Um, there's a real shift in funding that really goes much more to local control, which is why it's called local control, that, that districts and boards would make decisions that used to be made uh, at the legislative level. And um, so there's flexibility in that. But the other thing that's very important to recognize is that there's accountability for these state dollars, that there is really a requirement that you are generating a plan for how are you going to use these state dollars and who you're going to use them for and precisely what it is you're going to do and a whole piece on parent input and transparency, that when you're making these plans and when you're building this budget, that there's a very strong level of involvement from your community. Um, this is a cartoon I found out in the San Jose Mercury, and I just, I just thought it was a great uh, little image, and it, it shows her name is Professor Budget. Um, but basically what it shows is the old and the new um, model for, for um, finance. The old model being the revenue limit idea and then many, many pots, over 60 pots of categorical programs. And those were specialized programs with strings attached, heavily regulated for specific groups and, sp and for specific programs and projects. And so we used to have to manage all those and be very careful about how we spent that and be very careful about, you know, the regulations we're using. So the idea with the new LCFF program was really to try to kind of combine that uh, to a large degree and have that money be larger and more flexible, but then ultimately to have some other kind of factors that would work with students, a weighted student formula, recognizing again that there are certain students that have certain struggles coming into the system that really need additional attention and additional support. So we have a supplemental grant program, and this is for the students who are either low income, English learners, or foster youth, and they generate another factor um, by their being in the district. There's also a concentration camp, concentra concentration grant that, um, not concentration camp, um, concentration camp, that when you get that group of students over 55% of your district's population, that there's a new concentration fund that comes to you for the number of students over that 55%. So it's recognizing that students with large numbers 
uh, of students with these kind of challenges um, need additional support. Some of the, the old systems still remain. There's still some categorical programs. Special Ed is out there. Uh, QIA is still out there. Um, home to school transportation, there are a number that are still in place. But it's important to know that the vast majority of, of uh, categorical programs, state categorical programs, not federal, um, have been combined and have been flexed. So this talks a little bit about what those are. And, and Scott was really careful to talk, talk to me earlier this week. He said, make sure that you accentuate the target. Because I think one of the misunderstandings about this is all this money has arrived. There's really an eight-year rollout for this process. So we haven't seen all the money that, that's going to come through the LCFF. But you see, again, um, how it's kind of calculated, that there are different base grants. And these grants are based on different grade levels and grade spans. That's new in the system. Um, you also see that, you know, the supplemental grant and what that factor is, that it's a 20% factor um, for the students. You know, it, it's 20% over what they would have normally have generated. And then for the concentration grant, um, over the 55%, it's additional 50% of that full money for each of those students, and only for the students who are over 55% um, in, that, in that group. There's also an economic recovery target, which is to say that uh, the state is really trying to make us whole. I don't think that we're really affected by that at all. Um, so that's another piece of that. So there's a whole timeline for what's supposed to happen. And here's the thing. We've got two trains that are running down the track parallel, um, each one having to kind of interact with each other. But it's not like the things that are happening are really all that sequential. Um, we have the, the LCFF formula that came out in July and became the new way of funding, but it was really left to the State Board of Education to come up with what the regulations would be and how uh, what that LCAP, the Local Control Accountability Plan, would look like, what the template would be, what it would include. Those things are happening now. And so those, uh, those have been happening at the State Board of Ed meetings in November and will occur again in January. We're supposed to be able to have a local control accountability plan template by March, although there's, there's a good indication that it'll probably come sooner. We adopt the, the, the budget and the LCAP, and it's a three-year plan, although we update it annually. And as it mentions, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, it's 2021 when we see the full funding of this program. We're just seeing the beginnings of it. Um, the local accountability control plan is very, very different for us because what we're doing is we're looking at the funding, but we're actually naming, you know, the students that we're going to be targeting and how we're going to be supporting their efforts. So you have to have a plan that really gets to, um, the, you know, the students and the needs of the students, particularly student subgroups and particularly those who, who have difficulty in the system. So it's really about um, trying to close the achievement gap. Um, so you have to talk about the specific actions. There are also eight state priorities, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, even though this is flexible money, uh, and even though there's local control, we still are on the hook for uh, meeting certain requirements and for really going after priorities that the state has. I don't know that the, any of those priorities would be anything that anyone would have uh, argument with, but we still have those, those requirements. It's not the uh, you know, money to kind of do what you want with, necessarily. Um, here are the eight state priorities, and uh, we talked a little bit about it. In, in fact, in the, in the SI and A, uh, you heard a little bit about parent engagement. So, and, and the eight state re, um, the eight state priorities are also areas that our our new accountability system is supposed to meet. Not just the funding and the LCAP, but ultimately, if there's a replacement for the API, that the API be much more um, kind of holistic, and not necessarily just performance. Here's more of the details of what's, what are in those state uh, eight state priorities. I'm not going to run through those, but you can see the kind of measures that are there to, to show success in any of those eight priorities. So for example, attention to attendance. Attendance becomes now a priority, something that we have to actually speak to in our plan, something we actually need to, you know, to move on. Um, student engagement, attendance rates, um, absenteeism rates, school climate. We've, we've come here many times to talk about our suspension and expulsion rates. That counts now. That counts. You know, it's, I, it's always counted, but it's really counted also in our, in our uh, plan and in our funding. And, of course, parent engagement. Course access is another item that um, is another item that's interesting because you know, we talk about the kinds of courses that are, are going to get students college and career ready and making sure that things like AP courses have a demographic representation that all students have access. 
One of the things that have come out uh, most recently, and something you're probably going to hear a lot about, is the regulations regarding how it is um, you're going to design your plan and how it is you're going to work with specific groups of students. And so there are some, some uh, the template that's being developed and some of the regulations that are being developed have talked about how you would, how would you be able to demonstrate that you're really going after the targets that were intended by LCFF. These are the three that have been uh, promoted to the State Board of Education. I think WestEd is the group that, that, uh, that was tasked with doing this. One is that you would spend more, so that in your plan you would be able to show that you had spent more for specific students. You had spent more on programs. You had spent more on support. Um, the other one is that you provide more or improve, and that is that you would be able to demonstrate that you're providing a higher level of service. That may or may not involve spending more, but you're providing a higher level of service. And the third one really talks about achieve more, that you can demonstrate that, that whatever you're going to be doing is going to somehow get the, the, uh, the results that you're looking for for your groups. Um, and what's been really interesting is a lot of, um, a lot of interest groups have come out to say, uh, we don't believe that achieve more is really, you know, is, is really something we can measure, and they've been pretty strong with the State Board of Education. Most recently, we have some legislative leaders who have written a letter to the State Board of Education to basically say, um, we don't believe that achieve more is is really something that's, you know, that's going to be, um, that's going to gain the kind of the results that we're looking for. And they've they've even said to the State Board, you know, if if you don't kind of do these res regulations the way we're looking for, we'll be doing those for you. So there's a little bit of contention right now uh, when it comes to developing these things. But we believe that probably the first two will be, will survive the, the in the template. And kind of getting close to closing here, I'm gonna turn this thing off. Um, we have our own timeline for what we want to do. And one of the things that LCFF really requires is that we're working very closely with our community and we're also working with our constituency groups. We're working with our, uh, our, our bargaining units, our associations, our parent organizations and whatnot. So you'll see here that there's a, a, a calendar that we've designed going forward in the spring as we develop the plan and as we develop the budget and you'll see some dates. So we'll be working um, hard to get the word out and really trying to uh, get a good showing from our parents and our parent communities um, to begin to input into our plan. And you'll also see further as we go, go out that we, we develop that plan and that budget together, bring it to you in June, and that we also deliver that to, to the county office. The county office also has um, uh, some new responsibilities in this. It's very, very similar to AB 1200. So they're looking at our LCAP, the way they look at our budget, and determining whether we've really met the requirements or not. And one of the reasons we're, we're very concerned that we really do fill up uh, our, our parent forms and we really do get the word out is this, this came out of EdSource and it's just in the last week they've done a survey across the state of California. Most parents don't know about LCFF or don't understand it. Uh, they're saying about one in four really know anything about LCF. So um, as, you, as you can see, we have our work cut out for us. Finally, I leave you with some, some um, resources. Uh, CSBA, um, they have a great toolkit that, that they're using. I think some of you have seen that. Um, the Legislative Analyst Office, CDE. There are many, many other sources. It's kind of interesting to go online and see who else is talking about, uh, you know, various groups are, are looking into this. These are the ones that we draw from mostly. They're the ones that are, are more kind of um, tied to the, the actual legislation and what the actual plans are. Do you have any questions? Okay, I'll open up to board comment or questions. Any? Um, Mike, go ahead. Ms. Leland. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I know this was, uh, there were a lot of conversations at CSBA about um, uh, planning and getting ready for this, and I actually was able to pick up some examples from other districts. I don't know. I don't think we're behind because we don't have to have this uh, approved till mid, uh, late spring, early summer, but uh, they really had a jump on it and some real details. I know back to your page eight uh, where it has all of the measures that was really expanded on um, a lot more. So that's something we're going to be working on. Um, and, and we'll be providing input along with the community to sort of uh, strengthen these measures and provide additional um, activities and objectives for each one of those eight priority areas. Is that most, right? That's most definitely. Working. Okay. And, and you'll see from that calendar that there's a whole developmental process and the, the various 
constituency groups mm -hmm. we go out to. Um, Kylie and Scott and Julie and I meet every two weeks as a working group on LCFF and LCAP. So we've been working for quite some time on this and developing this calendar and the other things. But the bulk of the work, as you said, um, Ms. Leland, is that uh, we, you know, the, the bulk of the work is in the spring as we get into the development. And it's about right now, as I'm seeing our neighboring districts, it's, it's now in January that we're starting to see these parent forums. So we're, we're just about uh, in line with, with others in terms of how we've scheduled it. Uh, but just because the one I'm looking at is pretty well developed. And uh, anyway, it's nice to have the resources and I'll be anxious to look at the resources and the plans as they come forward. We can compare them to some of the material we already have. So that's good. And Ms. Viegas. Um, I'd just like to say when you do have the community meetings, um, I hope we get to know about it because I'd like to attend those. Mm -hmm. Good job, Bill. Ms. Kirby Gonzalez. I went to a workshop on <coughs> surveys and how to, um, and it was a really, really great workshop all about a lot of free resources and way, or really cost effective ways to survey and write good surveys. So um, I'm hopeful too that the new um, tech position that we're opening maybe could be somebody who could enlighten us on that as well and, and uh, work with the district to make sure we have really good communication with parents because the electronic surveys are a really great way um, I found. In. So thank you for this presentation. Ms. Cruz. I'm really excited about the LCCF. I know Dayton and I attended a workshop a few months ago when I brought the board back some information. And um, I encourage the board, if there's any more workshops, to, to try to attend because um, we had administrators there, teachers, um, and it was good to hear their input. And um, I also, really, everywhere I go, I encourage parents to get involved. Uh, yes. At the last PK, um, I, I was, they asked me to speak, and that was one thing I brought up is the local control funding and to really participate. So I would like to be part of the uh, getting the word out to the parents. So thank you so much. A lot of great things coming up. Thank you. Appreciate it. On to action item one, approve the Washington Unified School District's uh, financial statement independent audit of fiscal, for fiscal 2012-2013. Mr. Gillen. That's right, President Menke. We are asking um, respectfully that the board um, approve our financial statement independent audit for 2012-13. And Mr. James Marta is here from the Marta Group to talk about our audit. Thank you, Mr. Marta. Good evening. Got a presentation. There we go. Well, you know, the financial, the financial audit is a really important part of accountability. Uh, and you know what? You talk about the local control. There's lots of different funding requirements. Every time someone gives you a dollar, they want you to <coughs> report to them and be accountable for so many things. Well, the audit is a big part of that. Um, you know, it, the audit report is really uh, the culmination of, of the results of your operations. The financial statements are prepared by your, your staff as far as the numbers. Um, we prepare the audit report. Um, but the, what you should look at at what, we're, what the report says is, is the audit opinion a qualified opinion or a modified or unmodified opinion? And we used to always say, it's a, is it an unqualified opinion or a qualified? And now they change the wording a little bit, so we say modified. Um, the audit report language has changed. If you look at the opinion, it used to have lots, there's lots, still lots of paragraphs, lots of technical language, but now we have like some subtitles in there. So, you know, we're getting sophisticated here. It says, oh, well, here's what we're auditing, and here's what management's responsibilities are, and here's what the auditor is. So we put some titles in. So, you know, we kind of move slow, but, you know, hopefully that'll make that audit report a little bit more readable. Um, the, so it is an unmodified opinion. That's really good. Um, the next part of the audit after the opinion is the management discussion analysis. And that was put together um, as far as a requirement a number of years ago to help users better understand what's going on. It's an opportunity for management to speak a little bit more about what changed during the year, what are the highlights, and it's a great place for you to look at when you start reading the report to say, okay, what happened during the year? Now, your audit report is 71 pages summaries of what's going on. So this is a great place. You know, there's, there's uh, six, seven pages to highlight that. So, so what did happen during the year? So the financial statement are actually put together two different ways. 
So we have the regular fund statements, and then we have what's called government-wide. And the government-wide really takes all the fund statements and kind of combines them up and then puts the results of the liabilities there and the assets. So the, the, the long-term debt and all your buildings and stuff aren't included on your fund. So they kind of look a little bit different. And so the, the fund revenues are down about 1.6% from the prior years, and that's the government-wide. That's kind of everything together. Uh, down to uh, down from 68 million down to 67 million, and then the fund ex expenditures are uh, five point are up 5.5 million dollars. Now, what that is mostly due to is due to building activities, and so when you have a uh, building that happens, that's shown as an expenditure in your fund statements, and then uh, the net position government wide has decreased by 7.2 million dollars, and that's going to come partly from spending money, spending uh, debt. The, now, looking back over the, the fund financial statements, uh, the general fund balance is at $12.8 million, and that's a decrease of $2.3 million. But that's a planned decrease, and part of that is you have some financing that you are, you have it, it's getting paid, you're putting money aside to pay it off, it's required to have what's called a sinking fund. So you have to pay a lump after many years. So to come up with that money, you have to kind of put it into an account for a while. Well, it used to be put over in the general fund, and that's not really available for you to spend. And so that's not really useful to keep it over there. So it got moved over into another fund, and so because of that, you see the general fund balance drop down. And I think that's better for you to better understand what you have available to spend. And that was planned. And the district maintains a uh, 15.6% uh, reserve for economic uncertainty, a decrease from 16.3% uh, from the prior year. Now, what that is, is that's another measure. It, so when you want to benchmark your district, you can benchmark it another way. You, know, I mean, you benchmark it on education. You benchmark it on how much money you have or how your budget is. But this is a benchmark on how much fund balance that you have available at the end of the year compared to your budget as a whole and your outgo. And that is a measure of, well, what can you absorb in changes? And the state does have minimum guidelines. And uh, this is kind of small, but their minimum guidelines for your district would be 3%. And you could say, well, why don't we just have 3%? Well, the minimum is just that. It's the minimum that they require. And, and what the balances at the end do for you is they help you to absorb the changes that you have from year to year. And you do have changes. You have changes that you had during the economic downturn, although you had to respond to them. You have changes in, in what type of funding will come in from one year to another. You have other things that you might not anticipate always with repairs and maintenance. And then as you see with the changes in the local control funding, the, the, the concern would really be, okay, how's that gonna work? How's that gonna work for my district? Because every district's got needs, but how is that funding gonna change? The, this type of equity fund balance at the end is going to help you to be able to withstand some of these changes. And so that's a good thing, and you need to have that. Um, the, just graphically, just to show where your general fund revenues are, you know, about 47% are uh, federal and state aid, uh, and then you have operating grants, about 24%, so real specific. 25% is taxes, so that would be local taxes that come in. And, and then you have some interest in other revenues. The expenses, now this is more by operational area. The instruction is the biggest portion that would be expected, and that's 48%. And then you have related instructional per, um, services and pupil services, and, and general administration is 7%. And so that's a really good benchmark measure for any organization. Then if we look at it another way, we look at what, what other types of sources in the general fund, uh, the revenue limit is 68%, state and local is, state uh, sources are 18%, federal is 8%, and that kind of changes from year to year, and that, that I think uh, is almost about $4 million for your district, and uh, that is another part that is kind of concerned for school districts is how much um, federal revenue will be able to come down. Um, and that's one of the re things that you have to constantly look at your programs and how those are going to get funded, especially if you've got low-income programs. You know, how robust will the federal budget be able to afford that? 
And then another look at it is where are these spent? So we talked about instruction, and that's kind of, kind of on function. This is normal expenses. And you could see that salaries and benefits are the biggest part of this pie. And the, the concern about that that you should have as a, a board is when you look at the salaries and benefits, you know, we're all concerned about the benefits. I just got quotes from my company about what the new health care costs are going to be. And you, know, you see those rising. And so that's something that you have less control with or as far as what your employees are facing and you as a district uh, being part of that. And so those costs plus workers' comp are kind of that cost that keeps growing part of that budget and kind of encroaches perhaps on other areas. So that's the part you want to be aware of in looking at this piece of the pie. Now, average daily attendance, you talked about students showing up, and you, know, you can see that you have students showing up at the district, and that's a good thing. And now, this is more of an average number. So average daily attendance is, you know, for the year, this is how many students on average are showing up, and this is a um, part of the funding formula. And students showing up is important, but you get paid based on funding, so they're all important. And, and you know, if they don't show up and you can't get the funding, it's hard to do the good work. So what this shows is that, that growth in enrollment, and that helps because at, at a certain point, you know, I look at districts just like a business also. You've got to have a certain economy of scale. You know, if you have more students, sometimes you have a certain facility that you don't have to pay for another one. So it's good to have that type of growth and maintain that. So you have to look at that. They're your customer. How do you get them to come here? How do you stay there and maintain that? Sometimes we have districts with declining enrollment or others that might um, go to other districts. And so you've been attracting, retaining, and, and showing that growth. And so that's good for the district. So you are in a growth position. Um, the economic out outlook. Now, this is, I'm looking at really from the state perspective, and, th and that's not your district. And the state perspective is really important to understand well, what's going to trickle down and affect you. You have the local control funding formula, and that's certainly something that you're working with managing. But what is the state dealing with? Because what they deal with, you're going to have to deal with. So they, the economic uh, outlook is improved, OK? But what things has the state been kind of sleep, sweeping under the carpet or, or putting off? And the things that they've done to get through this is they've borrowed. They did short-term borrowing to get through the budget. They've borrowed from other funds in the state. And they've also put off uh, funding some things like the um, CalSTRS. And, and if you understand that they have all this happening, then you can have to understand that when new money comes into the state, it might not be a one-to-one -one where you're getting that money, that they have um, this backlog that they'll have to make up. And one big one is the, the STRS deficit, and that pension is about $4.5 billion just to maintain its head above water per year. And so that, that net's going to have to be paid. And so understanding that that's what the state's dealing with, um, you should remember that when you're looking at your budget and be cautious about when the state's promising money. You know, it's not going to be this one-to-one. -one. They have some things to absorb. And so really my recommendation to districts is, well, don't spend it till you get it, you know. Don't plan on it until you get that money. Um, the audit is really a, a critical process. And along with the audit, there are other communications that we send to you. There's letters in the back of the report, and there's another letter that comes with it. We have a report on this compliance with state laws and regulations. We have, uh, the, so the audit isn't just us going and checking to see if the invoices match what they show on the books and testing. We have to go out and look at a lot of compliance things. Do the, you know, are the students showing up? Or are you counting them right? And they, the state gives special things to look at. We look at your federal programs and special state programs. And so we have a report on that. Um, report on internal control over financial uh, reporting for government standards and a report on compliance with requirements to major federal programs so that the federal money that you get, we have to look at the different funds. And then a communication those charged with governance, you. So report on the state compliance, no matters. No matters to report. So we do a long checklist. We go out and check a lot of things. No matters. It's excellent. Um, report on internal control. No matters to report. So that's excellent. Um, report on compliance requirements to federal programs. No matters to report. Good. Um, internal control. So 
remember, we do look at a lot of details. You're dealing with this year about $80 million of expenditures. And so we come in and we critique and look at how everything is tied out. And we had a couple of things to recommend to improve. There was some bank reconciliations for the cafeteria accounts. We found some differences in the reconciliation that we brought to the attention of management for them. So they can um, pay some more attention to that and fix that up. Um, we looked at vacation accruals. We saw some policies for some um, bargaining groups of what they are allowed to accrual, but in, in that what was on the balance was higher. Now, that is going to happen. You know, that'll happen sometimes in timing when you, the district's been really busy, you've been um, cutting folks in the, over the years, and so you might have people who stay and they have to put in more hours not able to take that. Management's working with them to, do, to manage that, but we look at, okay, what does the rule say? And what do you have? And so what you have to do is really manage through that and say, okay, we've got some that are exceeding the balances. How do we get this resolved? And so we brought that to the attention. And then there was a large payable. So at the end of the year, we test to see if all the liabilities are recorded. And there happened to be a special case this year. There was a uh, building project invoice for over $600,000. And the invoice was kind of... Um, the, the liability was there, but the um, invoice was kind of being reviewed and... Um, they were adjusting it. And so because it was in that process, it didn't go through the regular payable process and get booked. And when, that, when we looked at that, we said, this is something that should get reported and recorded. So that was kind of a special deal this year. So we, when we find those, we have to note those in our report. So those were really special cases and um, a really good report. All those other technical things, no issues to report. So um, to report to you as the board, um, we, we didn't, we did the audit as planned. We had some changes in the accounting. We have to report to you if we have that. We had one change in the accounting was required under new accounting standards. You have some bond issuance costs, and when you issue the bonds, you can take those costs and, and kind of expense them over the life of the bond. Well, they changed the accounting for that, and now they said we have to expense it all this year. So we, that was a change by the Government Accounting Standards Board. They changed the definition of what an asset is, and so we adjusted it. So it's kind of a technical thing. It didn't change your cash. It didn't change it. It just kind of took something off of the balance sheet as an asset and expensed it right now. It doesn't really significantly affect your position. But otherwise, the audit was conducted as planned. Conclusion, the outlook of the state has improved. Um, the district continues to benefit from strong, sound financial management. I mean. We don't just check the numbers, do compliance. You know, when I question these things and, and um, talk to your management team, to Kylie and to Scott, you know, it, they demonstrate that they're really thoughtful and think about what's happening, what they're presenting to you. There's good reasonings for, you know, this, this year you've spent more than you brought in, but that was kind of a planned thing. You had some certain things that you were doing this year, and this is well thought out, not just responding to the current year, but it's a long-term plan, and that really demonstrates good management. Um, we really want to thank Kylie Lane and the rest of the district. You know, an audit is a difficult process for, you know, your staff, but they don't look at it as that type of challenge. We see them working together as partners. When we ask things, they're um, really helpful to get things together, and we work kind of hand in hand to get this job done. So 71-page uh, report of detail, really excellent result for the district, and so I would like to thank the staff for the help in that. Are there any questions? Well, thank you uh, very much. I wanted to move on to actually a blue slip uh, First, uh, Mr. Don Stoffer. Hello again. Um, I just want to make one comment first. Uh, you know, a, a, as you know, I'm kind of active in my association and talk to other associations around here. And it, I, I, this is something that gives me bragging rights that I can go around and say that our, our district's in good fiscal shape and we have good fiscal management. And I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I have a question. So there's the uh, money, that, uh, the 1.6 million that was transferred from general fund for debt service. Is that for the solar bonds? And then is that, be, and I assume that's being offset by savings that, that uh, the systems are accruing. Is, is that accounted somewhere as well, the savings? Yeah, it's, it's in your, your financials. If you were to go back in and do an analysis on uh, what you're paying to PG&E, 
or to another utility for the particular services, those costs went down. So, but it's not called out in an item in any of the reports, and I'd have to go back and look. No, it, you, you and you wouldn't see it specifically because you look at the trend analysis of the the cost of utility dropping significantly. And like when we brought these forward, we said if you when you sell this bond instead of writing the check to PG&E, you're yeah. going to write the check to the bond company. Right. It's just going to be less than the check that you're writing to PG&E. So you don't actually see a line that says savings. So there would be a drop in payments to PG&E. That's correct. And that would be accessible to view or to track yes. somehow way. Yes, and we're also tracking part of the offset for the QSCB or for the CREB, they're, they're both mm -hmm. working the same way, is you're getting revenue that's coming in uh, from the uh, solar initiative rebates and things along those lines. Um, we can bring you um, a, a pro forma on the financials for both the QSCB and the CREB at a future meeting if you'd like to see it, because I think it's really interesting to watch the cash flow because it front loads in the, the first five years when you're getting the money for the solar initiative rebates. And then in the out years, you don't have as much coming through. You front load, have positive cash the whole time. But again, it's a 25-year project that only has 16 years worth of debt. So you have nine years worth of generation of, of um, electricity where you're not writing a check for it at all. And that's where you end up making most of the money is on the backside. And that's something that I don't know if it would come back to the board or not, but maybe just information for the board if sure. certain board members or somebody like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there any comments or questions from the board? And not, so we will, uh, again, thank you. I didn't, I know you sat down, but thank you uh, so much for coming in and sharing that with us. I appreciate that. Uh, moving on to action item number two, approve the first interim fiscal report for fiscal year 2013-2014. Mr. Lentzberger. Can we go back to action item number two? I need the board to approve that report and take oh, a look. Oh, yes. At it. That's right. I've run action, not information. So <laughs> moved. I second. All those in favor say aye. 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 So moved. Action item number two, approve the first interim fiscal report for fiscal year 2013-2014. A brief presentation for you tonight, a few slides. Some of it is going to sound like, um, uh, you know, Bill and I were, you know, brothers for years because we're starting to talk the same language as far as the local control funding formula and the local control accountability plan and how uh, what you saw before was uh, a revenue stream and an expense uh, stream that didn't necessarily line up. Uh, and now with uh, the change in um, our funding, you're going to see them aligning more. And the easiest way to remember it is that the local control funding formula is your revenue and the local control accountability plan is your expenses. And they have to tie together. So first interim report, um, you've seen this slide before. I'd just like to, to review this um, with you so that you understand where we are at. Uh, a budget cycle for a school district is about 22 months, and at any given point, you're working in three fiscal years. Currently, we're working in fiscal 12-13 with the audit that you just approved. We have an interim report for 13-14 that I'm going to present to you now, and we've also started budget development for 14-15. So uh, a lot's going on in the financial office uh, during uh, the, the winter months. Um, positive certification is what we're always striving for. The three different certifications you can see on the page, positive, qualified, or negative. Uh, we like to, to be positive. The report that um, we're presenting to you tonight, we're recommending a positive certification because it meets the criteria for a positive certification under AB 1200. Uh, budget adjustments for the report. Uh, there, I called out five that I thought were uh, of significance. The first is, uh, as we were developing the budget and right after the, the first round of the budget and working through the 45-day revise, uh, we had several meetings where we had about $750,000 of restoration or expenditure expansion that the board approved. Those costs have all been encumbered within the budget as part of the first interim report. Uh, we also have accounted for uh, federal sequestration, 5% for this year. Uh, there was a narrative uh, at the beginning of the report, uh, and I talked about federal sequestration. Uh, Office of Management and Budget is saying up to 8%. Uh, we went ahead and assumed 5% for the budget year in the first two years out, which is the multi-year projection. Uh, they said 
8 to 13% for this year, and it came in at 5. So we're going to run with 5 for the first interim report. We should have more information by the second interim report. Uh, I think 5 is going to be the right number because I haven't read the details, but I heard they have an agreement for the federal budget, which is a good sign. Uh, the local control funding formula has been fully vetted for the first interim report. Uh, we are using the model that is on the FICMAT website that's been approved by FICMAT. Uh, Department of Finance is also supporting this model as well. Um, we think it is the best model uh, to use. Um, we're also very pleased that this model was developed by um, uh, folks who work in uh, the education finance arena. Uh, there's a subgroup called BASC. Uh, and it's county office uh, uh, finance folks, and they're the ones that put together and made sure that all the dots and I's were being, uh, all the I's were being dotted and the T's were being crossed as the formula was being put together. And it's interesting as you look at different parts of it, and uh, if we have an opportunity here at a future meeting, I'll show you how a formula that Bill has that shows those concentration grants and shows is a really high number, and in the local control funding formula, it's a smaller number because it's applied to the entire population, not just that percent that's above uh, the 55 percent, say, for that, um, the concentration grant. So. Um, hope to show that to you at a future meeting. Uh, Common Core is in this budget as well. It's $1.4 million. We 100% encumbered it just like you would with any other categorical program. We expect that money to roll as a carryover fund into next year since it's two-year money, but for purposes of budgeting, we assumed 100% encumbrance. Uh, and the multi-year projection is based on some conservative budgeting practices, which uh, are the practices that the, the board has um, uh, uh, dictated for us. Uh, so the local control funding formula, uh, this is uh, in the interim report. Instead of the revenue limit calculation that we used to see before, we now have this local control funding formula. There's not a mechanism in the state software to run this calculation. This is run outside the state software, and then we put numbers into specific points in the software. Uh, if there's ever any interest in finding out where these numbers get placed, let me know and I'll give you a, a, a tutorial on it because it's, it's actually quite interesting, but it's very, very detailed and for some folks would be rather boring. Um, target for us is $65 million, which is a great number, but as Mr. Spalding said, that is the eight-year target. That is not the money that the district is going to receive this year. Um, and uh, that's it for that particular slide. Um, this is a great slide, though, because this shows the graphic for the, the funding on the, um, uh, the pupil uh, subgroups as far as K3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12. Every school now is funded like a charter school has been funded for years as far as breaking out in those groups. And you'll notice that the, the base grant goes up and gets higher when you get into the high school level versus the K3 levels because of uh, the assumed cost that uh, educating high school students is more expensive than uh, the younger students. Then you have your grade span adjustment of 728 and $219, and that is your K3 class size reduction. Every school district gets it, whether they were participating before or not. And the 219 per student is the CT adjustment for grades 9 to 12. And then your base and concentration grants base is 55% of our students are on free and reduced because we have a 69% factor, and then the 14% add on to that for the concentration grant. The dollars as they break out, uh, the bulk of the money is in the base grant. Uh, and then the other parts uh, and pieces you can see there through, uh, it's the grade span adjustment, the supplemental grant, the concentration grant. Add-ons, uh, very unique on the bottom, it says TII, BG, and transportation. That's the TIG block grant in transportation. For us, that's $411,000, and it is all transportation money that we had received in prior years. We never received the TIG block grant. Uh, the key to the interim report for us from a revenue perspective is um, comparing the 45-day revise that we brought to you in August to the current funding model. And there's a couple things that uh, I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, the first is the bottom line number, which is uh, 46,680,000. $46, and the 45-day revise, you'll see the slide in the, the background on the bottom, it was 46,416. So the overall entitlement for 13, 14 grew by about $200,000. And that's as we went through the funding formula and we started tying uh, uh, a bow around uh, how the county office gets funded. 
and, and the different components that we have for court schools and community day schools and SELPA funding and some other things and the way that money moves across. So it increased our revenues, but we actually have an expenditure that offsets part of it on the other side. Uh, for this key, uh, current year, 11.78 is the funding gap multiplier. And that is the number that's up top. And for this district, it's $2.538 million. That is not the increase in funding the district will receive this year. And the reason why is if you look at the number two rows above that on that slide, the 44142 which is the floor, that is that hold harmless agreement that Bill was talking about that says no district will get funded less than before and they create a floor. We're a unique district in such that our floor is actually less than the money we received last year. Last year we received 44 million. So we're not gonna get the difference in between, I'm sorry, we, last year we received 44,334,000. The floor is 44,142,000. So our, the money we're gonna receive is the difference in between last year and the entitlement, not the base in the entitlement. It's a difference of about $200,000. Instead of 2.5 million, we're gonna receive 2.3. And I tried to highlight those and show you the, where where the calculation works, but we're gonna receive that, we're gonna receive the 46,680, which is $2.3 million more than we received last year. That's the easiest way to say it. It's complicated. But ask questions on this if you have them, because I wanna make sure we understand. Uh, a couple things that are uh, of importance, the local control funding formula, everyone's going, yay, great, we're getting more money, but there's some things in there that we're still required to do. We had a lot of money that used to be in the tier three flex and those um, revenues are now considered, are now rolled into local control funding formula, but we are still responsible for the legal requirements that were um, part of those funds when they were standalone categor categorical programs. The first one being uh, Williams compliance, and this is um, uh, monitoring teacher assignments, uh, adequacy of textbooks and things along those lines. The money for that is in local control funding formula, and we are still responsible for all of the requirements that were uh, associated with the Williams Act. Deferred maintenance, we've been um, uh, putting that into uh, fund balance uh, over the years. Uh, deferred maintenance was flex money. The state contribution was about $250,000. That money is in the local control funding formula. We have a responsibility to maintain our facilities. So in a future uh, time, we'll have to start talking about how do we look at the money that we're putting into the fund balance for deferred maintenance and allocate that money out to either another fund or start running projects out of the general fund that are deferred maintenance in, uh, in nature. Uh, and the other one, and this is one of the bigger ones, is routine restricted maintenance. Since we took bond money to build schools from the state in years past, the state sold a bond and they did their 50 cents on a dollar is what they say, it's not quite that much. Uh, we have a requirement to have a 3% reserve maintenance account and that, or excuse me, routine maintenance account. And that's to do, you know, uh, fixing light socks. I mean, the stuff that's done on a, a daily basis. Um, you know, if, if there's an electrical issue, we take care of the electrical issue. What our internal maintenance folks do on a daily basis, that's considered routine repair and maintenance. We now have a 3% factor. It's gonna come back in 15, 16. We're about 2%, a little bit heavier than 2%. And so over the next couple of years, uh, we'll bring to you the budget and we'll show you in the budget how we're shifting money over the next two years so we hit that 3% threshold in 15, 16. Uh, other big issue is cash. Uh, cash uh, is estimated to be negative $5.3 million uh, on June 30th. Superintendent and I had a conversation about this and he goes, you're, you're, not, you're not worried about this. I said, no, I'm not because last year at this point, cash was negative estimate $3.3 million for June. We didn't even have to do internal fund borrowing. We had positive cash in June. So we'll continue to watch the cash flow statement at the beginning of the year. Our, our cash is a little off because we're being funded under the old principal apportionment for revenue limit. It's not gonna catch up to us till about uh, March, April. So by March, April, we'll have a better look at that EPA fund that Prop 30 created that we get paid in June and whether or not we'll need to borrow cash. If we do, we'll know that by second interim and we'll have a conversation with the board about whether or not we do an internal borrowing from the facility fund or depending on the magnitude of it, uh, we can always do a TRAN, which is a tax and revenue anticipation of short-term borrowing. It's a bond. Uh, this district has done one before in my tenure. 
so it's not uncommon, um, but we, I don't even think we're gonna have to do it. I'm very confident that by the time we hit June and we get on the correct cycle for the local control funding formula, this was the old revenue limit apportionment cycle, I think cash is gonna be fine. Um, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because it is in the financials and it does show it's very glaring. You have this negative $3 million fund balance on June 30th. The ending fund balance for 13-14, we drop a little bit. Uh, you saw 12.8, we're now down to a little over $11 million and that's a combined uh, restricted and unrestricted. Uh, restricted is 9.9 .9 million. Uh, I'm sorry, unrestricted is 9.9 .9 million, restricted is just a little over a million dollars. A comment I want to make, um, Mr. Marta talked about a 15.6% economic uncertainty reserve. And if you were to look at the financials and look at the criteria and standards, which are, are all these things that they check uh, against the financials, it's in the reports, I think the last document in the report, there's a section in there that talks about the economic uncertainty reserve. Um, and if you look at that for last year, you'll see his number is really close, but it includes every single dollar that is available that you could use in liquidity. You have a fund balance reserve uh, by board policy of 6.5%. So when you look at these financials and you see an economic uncertainty reserve of $3.7 million, that's your 6.5% fund balance reserve. What Mr. Marta looks at is that 3.7 plus the undesignated of $4.5 million plus the $1.5 million for the deferred maintenance reserve plus the $60,000 in revolving in cash. He looks at the entire amount in liquidity and says that is your reserve for economic uncertainty. So it's just looked at a different way. When he said that, I made a really quick note, want to make sure that you understood we're not pushing a $15.6 million reserve. We have a stated reserve of 6.5% of fund balance and we have an undesignated amount. He includes that all in his calculation. So that's why there's a significant difference in between what he shows on an audit report and what we have in the financials. Uh, multi-year projection, the, uh, the LCFF model shows a multi-year projection where the Department of Finance has said, we are going to increase that funding gap excuse me, we're going to decrease the funding gap by making it, uh, an additional payment of 16.49% and 18.69% in 14-15 and 15-16 respectively. Um, that uh, would generate uh, funding increases of 3.3 and $3.4 million respectively. Uh, the base or the floor is now what we received this year. If you'll notice in this uh, uh, chart uh, under 14-15, the Funding floor is now 46680, which is the money we expect to receive this year. So every year that that compounds, your, your funding for this year becomes the floor for next year, and that's the, um, the hold harmless, so you never receive less money than you received the year before. Um, these numbers, as far as the Department of Finance's percentages, have not been updated since July. Um, we know that there's been some increases in revenue in some months, and there's been some decreases in revenues in other months. There's been some talk about the economy slowing down. There's this thing that came out today that said the economy is looking a little bit better. Um, these are a best case scenario. For our multi-year projection, we took a little bit more of a conservative approach, especially since this is first interim and we have yet to see the governor's budget and what he proposes. That comes out in about three weeks. So for purposes of making a compliant AB 1200 uh, multi-year projection, I assumed a, um, about 54 cents on a dollar compared to what the LCFF model showed. I have about 1.6 and $1.7 million in additional revenue on the unrestricted general fund in 14, 15, and 15, 16. Um, the reason we, we did this is because in years past, and Mr. Menke, you'll remember this, we would show you this chart that would say, well, if they funded the COLA this way, it would do this, but they haven't funded the COLA, and so the worst case scenario is this. Well, I can't bring you a worst case scenario that says we're going to receive zero additional funding because that's not realistic and it's not reasonable. But to say that we're going to receive a 7.5% increase in funding year over year for the next two years, when we have this year being the best year we've seen in years is just a tick under 5%. I don't think it's a good idea to say 7.5% today. So I show 3.57% compounding. It's, it makes uh, a fiscally solvent budget. And actually, um, if uh, a 2% increase in revenue, or excuse me, increase in expenditures year over year, which is what we've typically done, um, you end up with a positive fund balance in 14, 15, 15, 16, as far as uh, revenues over expenses. Once the governor's budget comes out, we'll reevaluate this. 
and we'll see what he says. And if they hold true and they say, yes, we're going to fund at that 16% for 14-15, then we'll revise this projection appropriately. Uh, which takes me to next steps. We're going to evaluate the governor's budget. It's due in three weeks. And so as soon as that comes out, we'll take that and we'll take our expenses through January 31st. Your next interim report is March 15th, so your first meeting in March. And we'll update and have everything that's uh, uh, part of the governor's budget proposal. And we'll put that into uh, our budget, just like we've done in years past. We always use the governor's budget proposal to base our interim multi-year projection and future budget planning. Um, we're going to monitor attendance. Our preliminary uh, uh, data on attendance is that uh, we should see an increase in attendance. Um, Mr. Marta showed you an ADA chart, and you saw the very last year there was a dip, and we did have declining enrollment last year. We declined by 40 students, and we saw that tick back up this year. So uh, we're hoping to see uh, some stronger numbers there. Uh, our philosophy has been to include that in the second interim report. Uh, continue cash management, update you on the appropriateness of whether or not we need to do any interfund borrowing, external borrowing, or we think it's going to be okay. And then uh, the continued joint development of the local control accountability plan. And I know I have more than 10 minutes, but there's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> So any, uh, any questions I will answer to the best of my ability. We unfortunately don't have any time for questions anymore. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> well, and maybe that's, you know, part of the. I, I will open it up to uh, board comments uh, and questions in a second. I would like to go to the blue slip first, Mr. Don Stoffer. Hello again. I have a few questions. Uh, I, I did notice an item in the uh, report that listed the CSBA conference expense at almost $37,000. And I want a little clarification on that, since it, I believe two of you went. So I, I, <laughs> I really don't think you you flew down on private jet and stayed in in five star hotels. But they may have. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, have a question on mandated costs. I noticed that the reimbursement from the state is estimated to be two hundred fifty thousand, a little bit more than that this year. I was wondering if. Uh, Scott had a, a number on what it actually does cost us for those expenses that do come under the criteria of mandated costs. Um, the fund balance that's legally restricted that on the first interim is listed as one, a little over one million, was a little bit uh, 1.4 at the 45 day. Is that the local control, or I mean, is that common core money, or is that something else? Part of it. Okay, and uh, the if I could have, uh, may, maybe this is not the right time, but maybe sometime, I notice in, in the description of general fund and the state, there was a item called education revenue augmentation fund. And I noticed it was a negative number, and I'm assuming that has something to do with the state, with the way state funds, and I, I would love an explanation of what that means at some point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lansberger. Just don't talk about the CSBA thing. I, I won't. Well, I, I, actually, I will, because it is in your, um, it, it's in your, uh, the narrative at the front, and I want to say it's part of uh, the comment about um, uh, the restoration uh, and expansion, uh, and it talks about the CSBA conference, but also other conferences, trainings in the CSBA conference combined. So that is cumulative everything going across the district administratively, not just the CSBA conference. I want to say the CSBA conference was a few thousand dollars. So that's all expenses for what did you say? traveling conference. I didn't hear what you said, the CSBA. One or two thousand. I have to go back and look. It's, it's, it was, it's only a few thousand dollars. It certainly is not $37,000. This is all traveling conference for the entire administration, not just the board. We were a small You were a very percentage. small portion of that. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Um, make that clear. Second question was... Uh, mandated cost as far as what it costs us to uh, to do those things we're not tracking that anymore since we're in the block grant we're going to get the money we just provide the service and we're not going to spend the additional time and cost to track it uh, unless um, you feel that that would be a good thing to do uh, typically though when we do that you're hiring a third party to do that and, and manage that process for you we didn't think that was a justifiable cost since we're going to get the money we just have to provide the service we don't need to track it anymore
about 1.4 to 1.6. It's, it's, it's fluctuating because at the 45-day revise, we still hadn't finished our unaudited actuals. And so the 45-day revise is an estimate on what's going on on the restricted side. Yes, the Common Core money is on the restricted side, and it did have an impact on, well, it didn't have an impact on fund balance because we completely encumbered it. So this is other uh, programmatic money that was not spent in 12-13 that was carryover money into 13-14. That's what changed that fund balance. Uh, and ERAF. ERAF is a negative number. ERAF is taxes. Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. It's part of property taxes. It comes from the county. You guys remember hearing about the triple flip? I don't want to get into the details about the triple flip, but it had to do with the vehicle license fee, and it created a negative number. And so it backfired on the state because it's a reduction of property taxes, and a reduction of property taxes <laughs> is an increase to state aid. They were trying to save themselves money, and they, they move the coconut shells around too many times, and it cost them money. So that's what ERAF is in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go to the board if you have any questions or comments. Ms. Uh, Viegas. Um, I have a question. Uh, did I hear you say increased transportation funds available, 200000 Was that right? Or? Mm, no. No, I said out of the, on the, the chart that showed, the pie chart that had the different pieces of the local control funding formula, there's an additional add-on, and we get, there's two components to that, TIG and transportation. We only have transportation, and it's $411,000. So that's, compared to what we have to pay for transportation, that's nothing. And that is both special ed and um, regular ed. It's only $400,000. It's not a whole lot of money. Okay. Just curious. No, we're, we've, we haven't received an increase in transportation funding since uh, 07, 08, when they put it into flex. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to thank Scott. Um, do an incredible job. Thank Kylie for us. Uh, it's Take nice care. to have a great audit report and, uh, you know, be stable and have a reserve. And, you know, I'm out there talking with other districts. Uh, we're in good shape, and I credit that to our superintendent and our associate soups and staff. It's really um, fabulous work, so thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. And again, I think it's the board and the board entrusting us and, and giving us a latitude to bring recommendations. And like you saw the, the conversation about the, the QSCB, it was planned. That was planned deficit spending, and we talked about it probably four or five times before we did it, and then we kept reiterating it in the financials so that when you saw that drop, you're going, yeah, we knew about that. And so that's what it's about is communication and making sure that you understand what the story is before we bring you a financial report. I don't think anything in here uh, was, should have been a shock to you. I mean, I think we've been pretty, pretty clear on where we're going and uh, very um, happy and, and uh, pleased with uh, the outlook for the future. So hopefully good things to come because I've had to give too many financial reports where there's been doom and gloom. So I like the positives. Thank you, Mr. Lansberger and Thank Kylie. You. Also, um, so I need a motion to approve this item. So moved. A second. I'll second. And all those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries. Uh, on to action item number three. Uh, approve first interim 2013-14 budget transfers. Is there a presentation associated or? Good evening. I'm Kylie Lane, Director of Fiscal Services, and um, you guys just approved the first interim, so I'm just going to make this very brief. Just ask that you approve the budget transfers that helped complete the first interim. Once it's approved, I will ask the County Office of um, Education to go ahead and move the approved budget to the revised. Thank you for that. Is there any questions from the board? Comments? And I need a motion to approve this item. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And motion carries. And on to consent items. Uh, we need a motion to approve consent items. So moved. I will second that motion. And all those in favor of to approve consent items say aye. 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 And on to future board agenda items. West Sacramento Early College Prep will be on the 1914, um, as discussed in our previous meeting. Um, are there any other uh, motions to attach board agenda items? Do we need to put the uh, workshop on there, or is that just going to be a given? Uh, that'll be a special board meeting. So we'll, have to, we'll talk more about uh, setting a date, and then we'll uh, set a date and announce that. And it will be in January? Uh, I'm hoping for it. That's when we usually try to do it. We try to do it January to January. 
So we'll, we'll throw out emails to find out who's available for which Saturdays uh, and uh, make that happen. Um, I would like to see, I don't know if it needs to be a board um, at the board meeting or how we'd like to do it, but I would like to see an update in the next coming board meetings about the restoration and expansion lists and, and how those things are going and, and um, how they've translated into the classroom and for students. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Uh, I need a motion for adjournment. So moved. I will second adjournment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Aye as well. So have a happy holidays. I just wanted, since Tony's here, I wanted to point out that um, while we're going to be at the VFW to celebrate the, the holiday season, we can follow up with a, a premier concert presentation at the high school. Um, we have a number of groups that will be performing. The Stonegate Bridgeway Island Concert Band will be performing. We'll have a concert group and a vocal ensemble. So it's going to be a great, great show. Six o'clock. Excellent. River City High School. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Very happy holidays.